Well, in the interest of time and all the things we're going to talk about today, while people are still coming in, I'm going to go ahead and get us kicked off. Um, so thank you for joining us on our journey into assignment designs today. I'm very excited to have this conversation and also be joined with some awesome colleagues um, who I will show you pictures of. We have Pat Hutchings will be joining us or is on with us, um, who's a senior scholar for NALOA and Tammy Eagleston from McKendree University and Chantel Stanford from Morehouse um, College of Medicine. So very excited. So welcome. If this is your first time to our series, this is a part of the series, but you, there's no expectation that you've listened to the other ones or been a part of them. You can come and go as you like. However, every Thursday at um, two, we do one of these webinars. So we hope you are able to join us for as many of these as you like. Um, they are all recorded, the slides are shared, so any of the hyperlinks and things that we have in there will come back out to you. Um, we do have an ongoing conversation on Twitter, and uh, there's also, if you're just coming to this, a Google Doc of resources that we keep updated on the NALOA website. So pretty much, if you go to our landing page, learningoutcomesassessment.org, you're going to find everything and recordings of stuff that we're talking about today. Um, so. Welcome. What are we doing today? What is our time together going to be like? Well, first, to also buy time to let people come in and join us, um, I am going to do a recap of the kind of high level things that we talked about in our two prior community check ins and updates. Um, so if you weren't a part of those, you'll get a super quick recap. If you were a part of those, you get the Cliff Notes version. So it's a win either way. Um, I will then go ahead and introduce our conversation on assignments and why we're talking about assignments and what we can do and how we're thinking about modifying um, the, the tools and materials to help us plan for online in the spring and summer. Um, and also thinking about planning out to the fall. How are we going to be doing this in, in meaningful ways as we do that? Pat Hutchings will go next and she'll share about reflective assignments and the role of reflection and what can we think about that space. Um, Tammy Eggleston will go with that, talking about how she's currently modifying assignments in our classes and in the current situation and circumstance and provide some insight there. And then Chantel will bring the perspective from a medical school and thinking about labs and, and all of those different areas. Um, there is, of course, time at the end for us to discuss and share, and please use the chat to talk to each other about different ideas. And just as a reminder, our slides for these are super text heavy, and that is intentional. Most of the time, we're free reeling on um, fun pictures and images and all this kind of stuff. Pretty much everything that we say is on the slide so that as you're sharing this, um, as you're coming back to it later, as you're processing with everything going on, you've got that information to help you filter and think through. So let me go ahead and get us kicked into our recap. So our first week when we did our community check-in and had the conversation, one of the main points we really wanted to get for folks was that this is not a test of online education. Um, we don't have time to do the planning and the design and all of those pieces to really make this work. This is really a triage situation of survival where we did an emergency move to remote instruction in the midst of a global pandemic. It has been disruptive, not just to teaching, but to our lives and our students um, and all these situations. So that was sort of point one. Point two from that was that we really need to think about this from compassion as opposed to compliance to drive decisions at this time. So our decisions that we're making in support of our students, that's really where we need to be focusing. The guidance and regulatory things can catch up and our decisions that we make can help and inform that move. And so if we're looking to the compliance piece, we really need to be thinking about compassion. Third point from our first week was listen to the students as much as you can, be flexible. Learning is compromised in the semester for everyone, faculty, staff, and our students. Um, and so this is not really about learning online. It's about how are we doing learning in a global pandemic crisis. So if we can keep that in mind, that that will be helpful. The following week, uh, we started talking about what are people doing around faculty evaluations and end of course evaluations. And most people were keeping them, but modifying the questions and deciding to use them as more of a formative planning tool, not as something that was part of an evaluation um, for promotion and tenure pieces. 
The other part was thinking about how do we be flexible with students was let's survey students. Um, the conversation on there was please don't over survey your students. There's a lot going on. They're getting tons of emails. Um, so, and if you are going to survey, partner with student affairs, but also a caveat of remember, this is a, a, a wonderful research opportunity as a research institute, we're, we're very aware, but these are people that have got a like, lot going on. And so remember, put your humanity hat on as, as you go into the, the survey part. The other part that we were talking about with surveys was thinking about getting that information through different ways. If we already feel physical distance um, as students, what are ways that we can help connect and bridge some of that gap? So is this phone calls, focus groups on Zoom? So while we do want to ensure that we're getting information from our students, are we thinking about getting that information different way? So maybe not a survey, maybe some other means. The last part that we talked about in our community check-in last week was to think about the policies that we're writing to not begin from a point of negativity in the perceptions of our students. So if we're writing from a place to say, somebody's gonna game this system, and that's where we're starting from, we should really reevaluate and think about how are we enabling learning for our students instead of blocking them from cheating in some of that. Uh, we also did talk briefly about assessment of student learning and should we do reports? Do we assess what's happening this semester? Pretty much it was agreed that while assessment of student learning is the process of looking at what our students learning is ongoing this semester and very important, the reporting of that in terms of do we submit a report in June, um, what are we, is a lower priority, one that can be postponed or altered in terms of how the data are collected, which again could be done through a focus group approach, um, a reflection, uh, and maybe a modification of the reporting form. So that was where the, that conversation ended up. And the last sort of point that we had um, on the, the wrap up of our community check-in conversations was please do not require a higher level of proof of learning in an online class than you would in a face-to-face. -face. So as you're thinking about assessing in an online environment, um, a lot of our best practices in online learning might not actually make sense for our current situation for ourselves and our students. Um, they might later, but we should be very mindful of if we're over asking in, in certain areas there. So super quick, recap of all the things students can be a partner in finding solutions in this these are not things that we have to solve on our own if you're interested in the more of the conversations please go back and watch the the webinar recordings from there but here today we are talking about assignments um, we do have resources that i'm going to pull from and in an april newsletter we're re uh, releasing a modified charrette toolkit uh, based on the things that we're going to talk about today for how do you do this in our COVID-19 situation. But we do have on our website, if you're like, I've never heard of these things before, you can go to under our work to assignments and see all the different sort of resources and pieces that we have um, available for, for that conversation. So one of the things that we wanted to do in talking about um, assignments is it's a great place to start to kind of go back to basics of what do we really want our students to know and be able to do? What are those basic learning outcomes that we really need them to get from this course or to build towards a program? And how are we thinking about the demonstrations of their learning and attaining that? Um, it's a helpful place to look at connection points. There's a link in here to a really nice article that rethinks our assignments online. But basically what we did in our charrettes is we would bring groups of faculty together, sure that's a fancy word for an assignment design conversation, give you the short one, to take a look at their assignment and to say, okay, how does this assignment relate to your learning outcomes? Um, do, they, do these match in meaningful ways? How does it line up with how you're actually grading or your evaluative criteria in relation to that assignment? And how are you supporting and scaffolding students to, to get there? So it's looking at what do you want people to do and how does this point connect? So that conversation around, well, what do we really want students to do is a nice place to come back and start as we think about it. We also know that clarity in instructions and prompts are important at any time. There's wonderful work that's been done by Mary Ann Winklemiss in Transparency in Teaching and Learning um, to say you need to be clear in our prompts and clarity now in information overload and brains that are scattered and so many different things that are taking people's attention is even more important. So if you're also interested in some uh, information about that not only is there a website but there's some really nice um, chapters in the transparent design and higher education teaching and leadership book um, based off of all the the work in tilt so i would definitely recommend taking a look there but 
the process that we did before, so sort of before COVID in this situation, was we would bring groups of faculty together to peer review their assignment. And it was a basically a round robin process where a faculty member would present an assignment, you would discuss it with a group of other faculty on guided questions to take a look at, and then you'd write some feedback to folks, move to the next person, revise your assignment, try it in class and get student feedback on it and, and go through this process. Now, it was a really nice structured process and it was great. And you can do this virtually. There's actually an example in the assignment toolbox and resources um, from the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia on our website of how they did a virtual one. But let's think about, for our current circumstances, what are what's going on, how might we do a virtual charrette as a way to help people future plan for assignments, but also help faculty stay connected with one another. So there's a couple of points of consideration. First one we can think about is, all right, uh, do we want to do this where everybody's on at the same time and we can all see each other and we're using some kind of technology like a Zoom meeting, let's say, we can put people in breakout rooms, or are we doing this where we are aware there's a lot going on, people's timing and what you thought your day was going to be may be very different depending on your home circumstances and situations. So we do we need opportunities for people to participate when they have time and in what ways. We also have questions around which technology if should we use to do that that allows um, for the breadth of our faculty in terms of what they have access to and the bandwidth of their internet. Um, in addition to their faculty time commitment, uh, how much time do we want to put into this? Is this something that's on radars and how much can we support sort of our, our adjunct faculty in thinking through this? So we have some considerations for things that we in talking with faculty um, that we want to put forward. So one is, yes, you can keep the same sort of structured process with breakout rooms and faculty can come together and talk about an assignment that they're trying to do or converge together to create a new assignment um, in, in, a, in a remote activity, but that that can be pretty much unrealistic for a lot of, lot of people. So a couple alternatives has been to have faculty write up an introduction of what the assignment is, what they're trying to do, where this fits into the curriculum and the program, um, and share that in a Google Doc that is shared with a group of faculty or the department so that people can go in and edit based on a set of shared questions over the course of a week. So I can go in when I have time, I can review and provide some comment and feedback, I can see that, I can reply to the comments and feedback, and as I've got attention, ideas, and thoughts can participate in that way. Another option that we've heard is faculty can record an introduction talking about their assignment um, what they hope it can do, what they're thinking about in it, what questions they have about modifying it, um, which can then be shared uh, with folks, which is also potentially good practice to do um, recording of your own lectures in the fall or, uh, and all of that. And one of the ones that we heard is most preferred was the screencast omatic.com. So if you're interested in that, that's an idea. The point is we need to think differently about our ways to allow people space and time to get feedback on their assignments. We also need to think differently about the types of questions that we're asking of our assignments from our faculty and from our staff. So historically, we went through this whole nice process where we got groups of faculty together nationally and we came up with a very focused um, list of questions that we would have people ask about their assignments. Three of those, I think, are still very relevant for our current situation, which are your basics. What learning outcomes will students demonstrate with this assignment? And how does this assignment need to be better modified to better align with those learning outcomes of interest? So this is really, you're getting into that. What's, what's the point? If we're trying to demonstrate a learning outcome, what learning outcomes are we trying to demonstrate? The question too about how does this align with our evaluative criteria? Are we sending mixed signals to our students? Did we tell them about, about something, but we're grading them on something else? Um, or the, the point system is maybe not in alignment with what we really want people to walk away and know from their assignment. So yes, that question remains. And also thinking about the assignment from the point of view of students, in terms of is the, the prompt clear? Does the language make sense? Do I understand what I'm supposed to be doing and what I need to do to, to complete this assignment are all questions that we think um, are still relevant and timely. However, I think there's three questions that we're, we're settled on to modify that we need to think about for our current situation. Those questions are asking about an assignment. How does this assignment really allow for flexible options or alternative demonstrations 
uh, for our students at this time? Is there something that a student can say, you know, I understand that learning outcome, but I'm demonstrating it in this way over here that is related to what I'm doing to homeschool my kid or related to the shift in how I'm working um, that I can put forward in this space. So needing to be flexible with timing, how we administer, um, what we're expecting from our students, um, and thinking too about culturally responsive demonstrations of learning is, is a question that we think is important to add. Another question to add to that is how do we need to modify this assignment or adjust it to current faculty and student circumstances and situations? Not every student has a webcam to be able to turn on. Not every student is able to record themselves talking about something. Um, not every student can download and watch um, a, a high bandwidth video. So how are we thinking about what are going on in our students' lives at all of these layers um, and prioritizing ways in which we're supporting our students and our learners, but modifying and adjusting it to be, to be mindful of those current situations. And the last question to sort of look at in relation to our current environment is, are there any unnecessary constraints that we have put on this assignment that need to be removed to accommodate learning in a global pandemic crisis? Um, an example that we had talked about last week was the idea of a timed exam. Um, and that what, what at one point was time that was allocated to being in a class, let's say, is no longer guaranteed that a student has that time to allocate to that class depending on their home situation and all of the things that are going on. Um, and so doing a timed exam, we might actually end up getting really bad demonstrations of learning, um, shutting some of our students out from that. Is that a required constraint to demonstrate that learning outcome? And if it isn't, can we remove it in ways that actually enable our students to participate and demonstrate? So thinking about adding additional questions to interrogate our assignments as we modify them for our current situations is one of the pieces that we wanted to do and sharing with our faculty on how they're each struggling in doing that. How are we modifying? Where are we going? What are you thinking? What are you not? Can be a great way to, to help bridge some of that um, physical distance that, that people are, are feeling and experiencing at this point in time. So those are six questions that we're sort of putting out there to have people take a look at their assignments as they're modifying it. But we also need to think about um, what are those alternative types of assign assessments and assignments that we can do at this time to get at our students learning? Some of what we plan to do, if you wanted to be hands on in the lab, for instance, aren't, aren't going to work. And students are very concerned, there's a link in here um, to an article about if that evidence is shifted this semester, will that count in the future? Or if they didn't demonstrate it in the way that's normally been expected, is that gonna come back and they're gonna have to do it again later? This is especially important for folks that are finishing um, up their degree or thinking about um, clinicals, placements, internships, those kinds of things. Um, if we're changing what that assessment is, is this something that's gonna come back and bite them in the butt, basically, is, is the concern. So some of the things though that we're hearing on what are these alternative assessments and assignments are students self-assessing. Students saying, here's the learning outcomes. Where do you think you are? Why do you think that? What kind of evidence do you have to back that up? And letting students really go through that. Um, coupled closely to that, uh, which Pat will talk about more, is reflection. So really thinking about what did you learn during this time and how does this fit? We're also seeing people do low bandwidth activities, like let's have our whole class edit a wiki page. Um, let's engage in it that way. Also thinking about instead of gathering, gathering individual level student data, how can we think about a focus group of students reflecting on things that give us some qualitative information that we can talk about from a program level perspective for that. Um, a really interesting one that came across uh, yesterday in a conversation was that students in a class wrote interview questions and a faculty member actually went and did a Zoom meeting with their, their colleague who was an author of this journal article that they were reading in the class and he asked the student questions and then the students got to watch it and sort of think differently about um, how we do academic research and the choices made in academic writing, which was a, a, a modified assignment instead of writing a research paper they were engaging and thinking through the choices we make in the writing of our research papers. So that was kind of cool, and I thought it would be good to share. Point is, there's a lot of different great ideas that are happening out there, um, and we need ways to think about and modify and, and be mindful of those situations. 
There's also some really great disciplinary resources that I want to point people to in this space. Um, the American Historical Association has two. One is a set of essays by historians um, that they put together that's really cool. The other is a wiki that is being updated regularly that um, historians are sharing discipline specific uh, information with each other, learning outcomes, lecture notes, video lectures, and different things that people can pull from um, to help put together uh, things so I don't have to do it all on my own I don't have to, do it to get to a place to, to move. To get to a place to... So, other things though we do have, just to wrap up this section before I turn it over to Pat, is we have an assignment library on the LOA website. And there are some assignments that may be of interest during this time. So I definitely recommend go take a look through the assignment library. But there's three that I pulled out. One is on disaster analysis, uh, where it's actually about looking at how the media portrays um, a, a natural disaster, which could easily be modified in terms of thinking about something that students are already doing, which is probably watching the news, staying updated on these things. Um, but, but engaging in that in an intellectual way. So I point to that one. Another one is from engineering, which is thinking about how are you protecting um, your data in this situation and your privacy, which is important as a lot of this stuff goes remote and students are doing these things and it's, it's a huge opportunity uh, for um, negative <laughs> providers potentially to come in into the space, so that's one. And the last that I would offer is a, 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 an assignment to check your internet speed. Uh, basically, so it, it has you test your line to see if you're getting the speed that you're paying for and then you graph it. So it's about quantitative reasoning and analysis, but something that is important and timely for a student um, if they have internet and want to engage in that. So I think there are things that we can pull from that are already exist, but we can also think about how to modify as well. So with that in mind, I'm going to pass this over to Pat. Um, and if you are also not familiar, I want to point to a great resource that Pat did which was pulling a paper together on the reflective assignments that folks have in our assignment library that I mentioned. So you can also check out that report. But for now, I will give this to Pat. All right, thank you, Natasha. Wow, what an overview. So um, I think where I might wanna pick up here is by hearkening back to, I think it was the first of the webinars, what now, three weeks ago, um, the sort of check-in webinar where we were talking, just as, as Natasha is saying, about um, finding ways to assess, to use assignments that are really sensitive to the very complicated, difficult circumstances that all of us, but especially students, find themselves in. And one of the things that started to come up right away was this notion that maybe we should think about assignments which have a reflective component. So, a um, good place to start here. Um, I did look through the entire repertoire of the assignment library, the Niloa Assignment Library, and was very struck by the fact that many of those assignments have an explicit reflective component. Um, and the, the essay that, that uh, Natasha was just pointing to is sort of what I found. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, but one conclusion there is reflective assignments can be useful any time. But I think um, listening to people talk about this and review or returning to Dewey a little bit, um, they may be especially appropriate right now as students struggle to find their way through the challenging circumstances posed by the coronavirus. Yes, these are very text-heavy slides. Um, so Dewey reminds us that, yes, people learn through experience, but not from experience alone. It takes reflection on top of experience, and experience and reflection are most likely to be, as he says, educative. Um, when you're in a a circumstance, a context that might be a little difficult, uncomfortable, problematic. Now, I bet all of us are aware that it, with too much of those last things, learning becomes more difficult. So finding the right sort of balancing point here is, is part of the challenge, I think, of reflective assignments and a circumstance that really points to the need for often a lot of scaffolding for these kinds of things. And the tilt model is actually a pretty good sort of framework for thinking about what that scaffolding might look like. Click. 
Thank you. <laughs> Natasha is running the slides. Um, so what is reflection? Boy, there are a lot of answers to that. Um, one that I really like is by a paper, a Niloa occasional paper that George Koo and three of uh, his colleagues did um, about, it's actually about e-portfolios and high impact practices, but one of their points is that those are a particularly powerful vehicle for learning and, and using dispositional attributes um, beyond the, the usual and familiar set of outcomes, critical thinking, communication, and so forth. Things like interpersonal and intrapersonal um, competencies, resilience, and yes, self-reflection. So I think that's important, and it, I, I really commend that essay to you. Um, because what I find is that some faculty, understandably, and no doubt some students, when they hear the word reflection, think about things that are sort of squishy and soft and subjective, and what in the heck are they doing in a, an academic context anyway? So the, the coup essay is a good answer for that. Um, reflection is a learned skill, as they point out, and I've pointed you to a number of other resources, um, the first two from Niloa and the third from a website called Improve with Metacognition, which has a neat series of essays by um, the same person, um, Patrick Cunningham, writing about metacognition, self-assessment, and so forth. So those are some things you can follow up on. Oh, I might just say uh, the Killen reference there um, is about theological reflection, and she uses this lovely phrase about um, pa pausing and pondering. I really like that as a way to think about what is entailed in reflection. So the report that uh, Natasha had up on the, what was it, previous slide, um, was my very inductive approach to go at the, the, the topic of reflective assignments. I didn't start with a big theory. I started by looking at what those assignments, the shape those assignments take, um, and what we can say about sort of the reflective moves that might be required or invited from students. And I found four of them. In about, there were about 20 assignments that had a very reflective uh, component. One is asking students simply to describe their own process as learners. What are you doing? As you, I mean, they might be engaged in a project, writing a paper, but sort of in a parallel processing kind of way. They're often, in some of these assignments, asked to describe what they're doing along the way. Turns out that's not so easy. Um, second, maybe harder yet, um, is to evaluate what difference um, that reflection makes. What are they actually learning about whatever it is they're looking at, including themselves? Um, the third um, is integration, making connections. This is a form of reflection that I think is most congenial to most faculty. Almost all of us are after that in some way in our courses and programs. Um, and particularly relevant here, I think, is making connections between the academic and the personal circumstances in which students find themselves today. And finally, um, borrowing a page from some of AAC and U's work, um, some of the reflective assignments have a kind of prospective as opposed to retrospective dimension, asking students to look ahead, to plan, to think about a future self. Um, oh, this is a quote from the assignment on disaster, disaster preparedness, and it points to that, maybe that first um, kind of move that I was just noting. Um, this is, um, well, you can kind of read this. This is what one faculty member said about why she finds self-reflective um, writing useful. Um, students talking about their skills and the fact that that's not, as I said, an easy thing to do. Uh, next one. So, <clears throat> especially in a NILOA webinar, um, the topic of assessment needs to arise. And I think one of the reflection, one of the, the challenges posed by reflective assignments is how you evaluate them. And I think we know that if they aren't evaluated, in some sense of that term, students are unlikely to take that kind of work seriously. 
So thinking about, you know, what that means in the very complicated, difficult current circumstances, um, it seems to me that we might think of this as an opportunity to try out different ways to evaluate reflective reflections themselves and the learning that comes from reflection. Um, I've uh, there's a, a link there to one rubric. It's from AAC and U. It's integrative and applied learning. And I think it has a lot of the features that we might possibly be interested in. But I guess my urging would be that we really focus on formative assessment here and thinking about the kind of feedback, as this says, that helps students become more able agents of their own lifelong learning. Self-assessment, metacognition, compassion, rather than compliance. That's a nice watchword for all of these webinars. And finally, yeah, what's good for students is also good for faculty. And that's really the big point, I think, of this webinar, that assignment design charrettes and I saw a question in the chat about why use that term. Um, a charrette is actually from architecture education, and it is a process of collaborative design undertaken in a limited amount of time. It's also kind of a more interesting term than let's have a small group discussion. So, um, in any event, um, what we've found and what Natasha has been describing, I think, is that um, bring coming together around assignment design is a pretty powerful context for faculty reflection as well. So you can learn all about that in the materials that, that Natasha was pointing you to. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Pat. I'm going to turn this over to Tammy. Um, and also, just as a reminder, as soon as this is done, I will send the slides with all the embedded links out to everybody that registered. So as soon as we're off the webinar, slides will come your way. Um, but I think Janine is trying to put some links in as we go. But Tammy, over to you. Great. Well, hello from um, McKendree University. It's a small private institution near St. Louis, but actually in Illinois. Um, I am a professor of psychology, but I'm also the associate provost for institutional effectiveness. Those of you at small colleges probably already wear many hats. And then with this event, we suddenly started to wear even more hats. So now I'm on Facebook daily giving tips to students. I'm giving tips to faculty and the associate faculty. So I wanted to go through um, my slides in a very real world, a new game plan since I'm teaching and trying to help others. So this really is a, um, uh, all hands on deck sort of time. So I appreciate Natasha and Pat for sort of setting the stage with some theory, but here we go with what do we do with that theory and how can we really put this in practice? And Natasha and Pat and I did um, work together too much one meeting beforehand. So I'm really glad that everything I said fits in nicely with them that I didn't suddenly say something that didn't fit in. So here we go. So I want to also kind of reiterate that this is not online learning. And I have um, been a big proponent of online learning for many years. And I'm a little fearful that some of my colleagues and some students now say that they hate online learning. So I think it's very important that we say um, this is not online learning. What we really are doing is remote learning during a crisis. And this quote that's been floating around that says, you are not working from home. You are at your home during a crisis trying to work. And I think that that's really important that we don't judge online learning during this time. Um, so just a couple of quotes. I am a psychology professor, so I'll also give you just a little bit of therapy. And you're, you're welcome. No charge for the therapy session that you'll get in the next five minutes. So next slide. Um, when this all started, which feels like you know, four years ago, but it was really only probably four weeks ago, I started to send out a lot of information to the full-time faculty and the part-time faculty. And right off the bat, my advice to everyone was to keep calm and go back to basics. I said, this is not the time to try to get really fancy. This is not the time to take your class and completely redo it in the next week that you have to get ready. This is really the time to go back to basics. So I tried to lay out some really simple steps. Um, I had a lot of part-time and full-time people who had never taught online, had 
never used Blackboard and they needed some really simple steps. So I said one thing, pull out the old catalog and let's see what the catalog says this course is even supposed to do. I actually think that's a great tip that we all should do on occasion because you teach the course and you kind of forget what the course is supposed to do. So pull out the catalog. See if in the next eight weeks you can just fulfill what that catalog said it was going to fulfill. Go back to your syllabus and look at those student learning outcomes that you put on there way back when, those five to seven student learning outcomes. Maybe you can look at those and say, in the first eight weeks, I already achieved four or five. What do I really need to work on in, in the next eight weeks? What really is the big picture? And what are those essential knowledge and skills, if you really had to decide? And then I said, just work on that in the next eight weeks. Take it right back to the basics. Um, as a psychologist, I'm always telling people that perception equals reality. So if you start to communicate with your students that this class is going to be really not great and you're sorry that they're not going to learn what they would have learned before and that things are going to be a mess and this is a mess that's what the students are going to feel but if you come on and you say good news everyone we're going to go back to the basics i'm going to be able to teach you the key pieces of information if anything you might learn the key pieces of information even better than before this all happened because we're really going to focus um, i really do believe that that if the faculty members even if inside maybe they're feeling very confused, they have to sort of tell the students that it will be okay. Even if you say you're learning things together. Um, my first Zoom meeting with my students, I had used Zoom, but not that much. My first Zoom meeting with students, I said, I'm going to do the very best I can to make sure you learn what you need to learn. So I think that perception equals reality is important for all of us, especially for our students. Um, I'm sneaking in a little bit of something that I sneak in on all my assessment workshops. This is NALOA, so come on, that's the A. We have to squeeze in some assessment. But I always think it's good to just remind people to go back to your outcomes, back to your objectives, think about the goals and the mission for your class. And I think during these times, going back to that big mission and the big goals is even more essential. Um, I oftentimes joke about teachable moments, how it's so important to try to teach students during times that they care about information. Um, so this is the epitome of a teachable moment. If you were waiting for the dream teachable moment, this is it. Um, I oftentimes say that we need to teach our students more on resiliency and grit and problem solving. Well, here's our chance. So this is a teachable moment. And I've already had two or three students, I teach a research group, um, they've already said, I never thought I would care what a normal distribution looked like. And all of a sudden now, every single day on television, there are normal distributions and flattening the curve. So students have already started to, to identify that some of the things that they've learned are actually being very useful right now. So with that, with these sort of teachable moments, big picture, here are some very simple tips that I think um, we all can think about. So one piece of advice that I've been giving to other faculty and myself, most of us probably had a final exam scheduled. If you had a face-to-face 16-week -face course, you probably had assignments, and then you had probably a final exam. That's still pretty traditional. And on our campus, that's still pretty favored, that during finals week, you give a final exam. As soon as the crisis happened, I knew I was not going to give a high stake final exam. I was not going to be using Blackboard. I was not going to be using Respondus lockdown browsers. Um, I knew I was not going to do that. So right off the bat, I knew that I wanted to have something else. And that something else that I've always talked about are the importance of a signature assignment, some sort of thing at the end that would be reflective, that would be a real world project, that would have key learning outcomes. So one of the first things I sent out to my students was, I'm going to take a look at the syllabus. I'm going to delete some things. There will not be a final exam. Instead, we will have a final signature assignment. And right away, I started to get emails from students saying, thank you, Tammy. That was the thing I was worried about was this, this final exam. So one simple thing I think you could start to encourage people is to maybe give up that final exam high stakes assignment for something else. Um, if you wanted to, you could tell students, there will either be this signature assignment or I will put an online multiple choice quiz together for you. You maybe could give them that, that choice if they wanted to. Um, the other thing I have really been emphasizing with this is I think when we all started to move suddenly 100% online or remote, 
a lot of people got really excited about technology and I was getting a lot of emails from people saying, can you teach me, Tammy, how to use Flipgrid? Tammy, can you teach me how to do podcasts? Tammy, what about that virtual timeline you've talked about? Okay, I love all those tools. I've done a lot of talks about incorporating technology, but I don't really think that this is the time that if you've never used technology and you've never taught the technology in your class to suddenly try to throw a bunch of technology onto your class. I've been encouraging um, faculty, if you already were using videos, then keep using videos. If you already had a wiki assignment that you talked about, keep the wiki assignment. If you've already been using blogs, keep the blogs. Um, but I think some people during this time, rather than thinking about the learning, they jumped on technology. So my advice is maybe use the technology you know, but don't maybe add too much more technology. So this next slide is really my real time calling an audible. Um, so for those football fans, you know, that's when you thought you had a plan, but all of a sudden everything has changed and it's time to change things up. So here are my simple audible um, survival tips. Keep the assignments and the due dates that still are essential and still make sense. So if you had a weekly discussion board already in your class, and actually I did in a lot of my classes, I've kept all those weekly discussion boards. I already had them there. The students are used to them. And if anything, I think that gives them a sense of a routine. So if you already have things that are working, just keep those. Delete some assignments. Uh, some of those assignments that you now say I don't think um, are going to work, just delete those. And um, I put, really, that's okay. I think that's hard for faculty to want to ever take something away. Um, alter some of the key assignments and then give choices. And whatever you do, just keep communicating. I actually took the old syllabus, made a new syllabus, and put them next to each other so the students could see what had changed. So this next slide, I think for me, was really the heart of how I altered and called my Audible. So I would encourage some of you to maybe even do this next slide to, um, that's my Natasha, my next slide. <laughs> there we go. To really even think about laying out all of the courses that you teach. And if you are a designer and helping other faculty right now, maybe really encourage them to think like this. So they lay out the different courses that they might be teaching this semester. Have them really identify the big picture. This is actually above student learning outcomes. This is really why does this course even exist? And then what I would argue for me, what could I do instead of that final exam? So basically, here's my course. Here's what I really care about in this course. And if I eliminate the final exam, how could I make a different um, just a, a different assignment that wouldn't be the final exam. So for human sexuality, for example, I decided to completely eliminate the final exam and instead I gave them choices of things that they could do for that same 100 points, if you will. Um, they could do movie analyses, they could interview, they could do a social media analysis, they could do a report on what might happen to relationships during COVID-19. Um, what do they think? Is that going to strengthen marriages? Could that actually hurt marriages? Um, so they have all these different choices that I have laid out. For sports psychology, I actually had the sports psychology class start to create a Facebook page with references and links about how can athletes deal with with suddenly losing their sport for the semester. So many of our athletes suddenly had their sports cut short and that seemed like the perfect thing for students to think about. Um, with social psychology, one of our topics is norms. So I'm having them apply some of these theories in social psych to how we may change social norms forever. Um, maybe we'll never shake hands again, for example. That would be one example. So I think this grid can really help you think about your courses, the big picture and the assignments. And then finally, the next slide um, is for me, just my little pep talk, focus on what you have instead of what you don't have. I think it's easy for us to think about all that we've lost, but I'm trying to flip that a little bit for myself and my students and say, so we've lost some things in class, but now you're at home living with your mom. This would be a great time to interview your mom about something that we're learning in class. Um, maybe now that you're home, you might be watching a movie with your partner. This is a great time. I want you to watch a movie um, with your partner on a topic, and then you two have a discussion. So students have really adapted to that, where I've said, let's think about what you do have instead of uh, about what you don't have. 
And then my last couple, hopefully, motivational slides on here. Um, this should be your opportunity for choice and flexibility and application and reflection. Uh, some of my colleagues have been sharing ideas because our campus is small enough that we have a small uh, listserv. And after I said, I'm giving up my final exam and here's what I'm going to do, people started to come out with, here's what they're going to do for their final exams. A history professor on my campus is going to talk about previous health challenges like the 1918 flu epidemic. A biology professor found an amazing simulation on how viruses are spread. She said normally students wouldn't have cared so much. Suddenly they care about this simulation. Political science is looking at the difference between state and federal government and who's who's in charge of doing certain things. Um, an English professor said they completely changed their final paper topics to things about online learning, stress management, time management. And a music professor is actually having her students post students performing their music on social media and we can go on and watch. So really there's a lot of choice and flexibility that you could add to these assignments. So final slide is just basically a few more um, motivational quotes for you, but I really do like the one about look how much you've already managed look how resilient you've already been there's no right way to respond because it's never happened before give yourself some credit there's no one in the whole world who has this figured out so it's absolutely okay if you don't either and uh, I've been sharing some of these with my colleagues and then also with my students awesome thank you so much Tammy for sharing um, your process in real time and how you're going through that I want to now turn this over to Chantel who's going to be talking about um, what they've been doing at the Morehouse School of Medicine. So Chantel, it is over to you. Hi there. Um, so I'm Chantel Stanford. I'm the curriculum manager of graduate education and biomedical sciences at the Morehouse School of Medicine. Um, um, as you may guess that the scientists, the scientific world has uh, tried to take a standstill of just what, what should we do now? Because um, the impact of, of them coming out of labs and into a virtual world um, is very unfamiliar to many of our faculty. Um, so I just had a couple of uh, things that I wanted to share. If you can just click at the bottom of the sky. Um, at, the, at the very bottom of the sky, there should have been a little video that has a couple of quotes. Yeah. And this is me where I'm trying to guide, oh, trying to guide through and help, um, help them out, basically telling them not to start all over again, but use the essentials of what they have already. And, um, so at our school, um, again, we didn't want them to think that they had to have everything perfect, that it was a progress and not perfection is what we're looking for. And um, allowing them the opportunity to not, um, to, to not have to redo things all over again, but just work with what they have. And as Tammy stated, um, and, and I think Pat stated some of the same things, is not reinvent not revent, um, not uh, reventing the wheel, but using those resources of what they already have and not thinking that, okay, this is an online platform that they're going to be on um, the whole time. And then what does that look like for our students? Now, when I say our students, I have seven programs that are in um, graduate education of biomedical sciences. So these are primary, these are students that are primarily in the lab all the time, as well as our school of medicine, which is our medical, um, our, our medical side. So again, these are, um, these are institute, these are uh, a group of students that normally are in um, either in rounds at the hospital, which we did have them there for a little while. Um, but um, due to everything that's going on was uh, pulled out. So now we had to decide like how is, how is a learning going to look for them? Um, I will stick to my side. I'll give you a little bit what happened on, you know, what happened on the medical side, um, simply from our institution as well as um, some other institutions um, that I do know about that work with medical students. Um, one, I will say faculty training. So um, we were on a call a little while, uh, about a week or so ago, and I mentioned that we have to remember that we are living, we live in a digital age, right? That our students are connected to everything digital, everything electronic. <laughs> they are not, it's all familiar, unfamiliar to them. Now this might be an unfamiliar setting and psychologically can have an impact on them, um, but if the if the faculties 
uh, the faculty members learn to relax a little and not get in such a panic, but then come up with a plan, a master plan, <laughs> that, te that, um, that then the students will be able to feel a little bit more comfortable in um, their settings. So of course, it took a lot of um, faculty training, as Tammy was saying, that you know, not um, making them do a lot of technology, because of course, when we talked about virtual, talk about remote, they automatically go to, um, well, let's do every, you know, looking for all of this um, technology to then teach our students and. So we wanted to get away from that. We wanted to get, um, of course, in our field, we have a lot of standardized exams that they have to get ready for. There are a lot of um, lab work, uh, whether it's working with animals or um, sales, cell cultures and that type of thing. So what we decided that if you are don't have to not start anything new, of course, with our students, we ask them not to start anything new, um, but uh, to start working with what they, what they already have. And um, so we will go on some faculty training, a lot of that, a lot of continued communication, like just plenty of communication, overload of communication, just to make sure that they're comfortable, that faculty are, um, are comfortable as well. We designed something called the Jets Cafe. And this is for our students, because a lot of times our students are used to just coming into our offices, having conversation, what's next for me, this is what I'm doing in the lab. So we have these um, designated times where the students drop by. Um, and then during, during those times are, are de-stressor moments as well because they are wor worrying about, well, what's gonna happen to my lab? What does that look like for my next, um, my next rotation or something like that? So this is an opportunity for them to come and let's discuss that. Um, small group um, virtual meetings, we, we, um, we ask them to make sure that they're meeting together, that they um, start to formulate their own on online learning communities. And this is a perfect opportunity for them to get together just as they would in conference B or conference C. Well, now they have a whole virtual world that they can um, communicate in. We decided, well, we didn't decide, but, but on our campus, the majority, uh, we only use maybe two or three um, electronic tools. That is our Canvas, which we've always used, the LMS, um, Zoom, and um, yeah, that's probably about it. <laughs> um, for the most part, our faculty do, do that. We have our virtual town halls um, via Zoom. And then we did academic advisement as well as that's an opportunity for us not only just to, um, to give them formative feedback, but also to look at the outcomes of where they are right now. And that um, academic advisement did not stop just because we were off, off campus it um, gave us an opportunity to really dive into that time and find out one by one, how are they really feeling? Like, what, what's going on? Are you nervous? Like, what, where were you in your lab? Um, those type of things. And what, what is it to come? So um, next. So the transition for us um, from the scientific um, labs to an online environment, again, um, for the faculty, I think that was for most of them, uh, not a world that they were familiar with. So we had to do some of the um, basic learning um, for online with them. And we talked about different type of learning tools, that, um, uh, synchronized learning, where we had to even get um, faculty to understand because again, they had some of the same questions that the students had. Like, what does this look like now? Because I had students in my lab, what are they going to do? And so we gave them um, some, um, some ideas of where to start and what's already going on with them. So you can just um, click through again. So we looked at um, the virtual science, uh, scientific seminars. Normally these would take um, place within our halls, within our uh, conference rooms and our larger um, halls. And then, um, so now they're virtual. Oh, there's this is still the same material. We've just taken it online. Uh, lunch and learns, where we have opened up the door again for some of those. Some lunch and learns are for our faculty so that they can get to uh, the basics and the fun um, things of Zoom, for whether it's polls um, that they can do in Zoom or using Kahoot or um, sending those students into breakout rooms and, and doing some of that work. 
um, writing groups and other small group meetings. Again, um, any type of um, uh, where they're live. And this was the uh, the live group meetings and that type of thing using poll polls and um, pollings and um, breakout rooms, uh, study groups. We encourage our students to continue on with their study groups and also continue to meet with their um, mentors and their advisors and, and that type of thing. Um, on the medical side, and of course, live lectures. On the medical side, um, they've done a lot of this too, mostly live lectures. Um, but they have gone a lot more towards the recorded lectures and PowerPoint slides and um, reading the research um, materials and the re um, literature that they will be assigned to um, that goes along with their studies. Um, a lot of flipped classroom work, discussion boards, some things that we've already done, been doing, journal clubs, we've already been doing that. A lot of people use video already, TED Talks, YouTube, Vimo. Um, and scientific videos. For assessments, of course, we had to talk about assessment. And I like what Tammy said was, Tammy, I think, um, Tammy or Pat, that said, you know, this isn't the time to worry about if the student is going to cheat too much or not. Um, first of all, they're already nervous as it is. Um, the time test, we do still have time tests. Um, if I had my way, we wouldn't, but <laughs> there's still time tests, but there is a, um, a leeway that it's not so as, uh, stringent uh, where they may have 19 um, questions. Now they're out of the night, they only have to answer five out of the 19. Um, all of our questions on, on this side are more of uh, sm small, um, short answer questions. So there's that uh, opportunity for that. There's also opportunity for f reflection. But we did, we did move to a virtual proctoring system. Um, and that has has been working for um, for us. And again, that's um, to ease the minds of some of our faculty. Um, so, um, but some of them have gone to, uh, you know, for reflection and finding out where they are. Um, also, on the med side, stimulated pa stimulation patients and um, vignettes and um, problem-based uh, learning is, is big for them. Um, right now, again, um, the, the standardized exams uh, for um, mainly for the med school, had they're gone. Some of them have gone online. Some of the MCATs have been pushed back or postponed right now. We um, so we, we're making provisions to have compassion for our students and being patient and all of that. Um, we also move from lab work um, to, you know, um, we try to make sure that no one is on campus right now. But if there has to be, it's for a very, very limited time and only one or two people in the lab. And that one person is the student and the second person being a mentor or something like that. Um, other than that, not at all. So this is a good time for them to you know, do a lot more reading um, lots of writing because a lot of our students, because they're writing grants, they're getting their manuscripts together, they're having culminating projects. So they have a lot of writing to do and um, analyzing their data, um, research findings, and um, preparing uh, um, funding, I'm sorry, research, looking for grants for their, um, to fund their projects because these are graduate students. They're not, um, you know, undergrads. So they had, this is real work. Um, it. It's, it's all real work, but <laughs> this is real life work that they're having to do. And so, you know, um, they're out there really uh, trying to, to save the world, basically, I don't know, preparing um, presentations and researching potential um, projects and mentors. We've asked them for our first year students are that these were lab rotations. These are during the time that they normally would go four weeks in one lab and four weeks in another lab. But instead, we asked them to research a person that you would like to for the, to be your mentor. Look at the work that they've done and then find out an opportunity for you to sit down and interview them and have conversation about what they expect, you know, what what they are, um, what their aims are, and how you can fit into those labs. These are a good time for some of that work to be done. And then lastly, we talked about the culminating projects and thesis and dissertation defenses, which at this point they're already nervous. And so 
we don't need to add to it um, any more than what it already is going on. And now that you've put them in a chaotic situation and then everything has to be virtual, um, you know, we have tried to make it a smooth transition for them as well. So they, um, we've kept the schedule as we um, would normally have, but everything has gone to virtual and um, we are streaming and allowing um, the, the only the committee members have to be present, but uh, others can stream in. And we're even trying to um, make sure that they are able to raise hand inside the Zoom to ask questions and, and that type of thing. So um, again, we've just, we've tried to, I have tried to work with the faculty and we'll be doing even more of that, of, of making sure that they are comfortable in the world that they are in currently. And I've encouraged them, if you do have to give assignments, because five of our um, major um, outcomes that we are normally looking for are scientific experiments and of course, critical thinking. And this is a good time to do some of that and as Pat was saying about reflection of what it is that they learn, and then how is what they're doing currently in the labs or um, what they're researching, how does that fit in today's, um, what's going on today? And so we, we decided to do a lot of that and I encourage my faculty to do a lot of that as well. Um, Chantel, I'm sorry to jump in, but I wanna be mindful of folks' times and we are at time. Clearly, these are a wonderful wealth of information. So please do reach out to Chantel or Tammy or Pat and myself um, for additional ideas. Um, a couple of other things in the slides. There are, some, there are links in here for some other ideas about science labs and also some ideas about um, being mindful of use of video technology and some of the concerns that people have in different situations to better understand why some students want to turn off video cameras. So there's some additional pieces there. And of course, come back and join us next week while we think about, okay, so we had these classes. How does this connect to classes in the future, thinking about our program alignment and how do we need to rethink some mapping in those pieces to start planning for the future? How do we talk about and report on this stuff? And then how do we also make what we did pretty clear and transparent? So thank you so much to Tammy, Pat, and Chantel. Your expertise is wonderful. Thank you all for joining us and we hope to see you next week. Stay okay. safe and wash your hands. You. Don't touch your face. <laughs> all right, thanks everyone.